Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Now listen to me. And if you move in God's timing, there will always be an anointing on it that will make it doable and even relatively easy. But if you wait till your time, till you think you're ready, then you're likely to have to try to do it by yourself without God's help and His anointing. One of my goals is to help all of us come to the point where we're more God inside minded, where we really have a revelation that Christ lives inside of us, that we are the home of God. That is so amazing that every time we hear that, we should go, I am the home of God. Colossians 1.27 says, the mystery of the ages is Christ in us, the hope of glory. I believe that Christ has come to live in us because there's no way that we can hope to live the life that he wants us to live if his presence is not in us all the time, strengthening us, teaching us, giving us wisdom, giving us the strength to do what he's asking us to do. Amen. So I just want to say for the rest of this service today, we're going to do some house cleaning. And we're going to talk about your heart, the home of your heart where Christ lives. First of all, there's many rooms in a house. The first room that we might want to think about today and make sure that it's clean is the study or the library, which is our mind. What kind of things do you think about? What if your mind would suddenly be turned into a movie screen for everybody to see what was going on in there? Some of you wouldn't even want me to see the things that you've thought about me since you got in the building. <laughs> well, pff, 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 wonder what she paid for that ring she's wearing. <laughs> well, you nosy thing, you, somebody gave it to me. <laughs> well, yep, 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 yep. What goes on in your mind? The Bible says if you hate your brother, it's the same as to murder him. If you lust after a woman, it's the same as committing adultery. <laughs> Do you honestly think, man or woman, that you can go to your place of employment and you can have all kinds of lustful thoughts about somebody else that's there and play around with something like that in your mind and actually it never caused you a problem? God knows what you're thinking. He's grieved about that kind of stuff. Philippians 4 says, think on these things. Whatsoever things are true and pure and gracious and good and kind and winsome and gracious of another good report. 2 Corinthians 10 says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, reasoning, theory, and every high and lofty thing that exalts itself against the true knowledge of God. Let's work at thinking things that God would want us to think. When you find yourself thinking something that's ungodly and the Holy Spirit will convict you if you begin to ask him to, then just quickly say, oh God, I'm sorry. I mean, I know how we all are. Sometimes a thought can go through our head and we think, my gosh, am I even saved? But you know, the devil is able to interject thoughts in your mind. They're not your thoughts till you take them and meditate on them. Did you hear me? The enemy can put a wrong thought in your mind. Our mind is the battlefield. But they don't become your thought till you take it and begin to meditate on it and roll it over and over on the inside of you. And the more you think about something, the more it becomes part of you. How about the dining room of the house? where our appetites and desires are. Can we turn that room over to God? God, I know there may be a lot of things that I want, but I just want to make it clear today that I really only want what you want. So if I'm wanting anything you don't want, please don't give it to me. 
one of the girls that travels with me and I were talking this morning and she said, they've been a little quieter here in Atlanta than they were the last place we were. I said, it's because of what I'm teaching. <laughs> this is a message where you groan first and you shout later. It really doesn't matter to me if you get excited as long as you get helped. Amen. I'm going to stand before God someday and give an account of the gift that He's given me. And I have to be responsible to God to speak what I believe He puts in my mouth. And I want to see us be the real deal. I want God to have some kids He can be proud of, some kids He can trust. Amen. And I want you to be one of them. And I want to be one of them. Psalm 37, 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the secret petitions and desires of your heart. Keep God first and if a desire you have is right, God will bring it in the right time in the right way. We don't ever have to frustrate ourselves and stress ourselves out trying to get something that we want. And I know when you the very thought of not getting what you want gives your flesh the creepy crawlies. <laughs> but God's smarter than we are. James 4, 1 and 2. Our desires of things that we want happens to be the major cause of the problems in our life. What leads to strife? Discords, feuds. How do conflicts, quarrels, and fights originate among you? Do they not arise from your sensual desires that are ever warring in your bodily members? I want, 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 I want more, 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 more. I want, I want, I want, I want more, more, more. I want more, I want more, I want, I want, I want more. You're jealous and you covet what other people have? And your desires go unfulfilled, so you become a murderer because to hate is to murder as far as your hearts are concerned. And you know, whatever. Let's just say you're a single woman and you've been single way longer than you want to be. And you've had to watch five of your friends get married in the last two years. And truth is, is way down deep inside, you got a little resentment there and a little jealousy and a little attitude. Well, you better be careful. God wants us to be happy for people when they're blessed. He wants us to trust that He'll do the right thing for us at the right time. So then James goes on to say, you have not because you ask not. You have not because you ask not. If you want something, ask God for it. But if He doesn't give it to you, know that He's got something better in mind and you're not smart enough not to ask for that yet. We don't ever have to get upset because we don't get what we want. Because honestly and truly, if what we want is what God wants, there's no devil in hell that can keep it away from us. Did you hear me? I said, if what you want is what God wants, there's no devil in hell that can keep you from getting it. You don't need to wear yourself out rebuking the devil. You obey God, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. In our submission to God, we are resisting the devil. And I'm not saying not to take authority over him. I think the verbal command is awesome. Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. But I spent years screaming at demons thinking the devil was my problem, and all I got was a sore throat. <laughs> it took me a lot of years living as a sad, miserable, frustrated Christian, trying to work all these principles of faith and all these principles of prosperity and principles of success and principles of spiritual warfare. <laughs> to finally realize, God, if this was right and I was ready for it and it was the right time, then you wouldn't have any trouble doing it. Good, 10 of you believe me.
I am so encouraged that you're getting a lot out of this. How about the living room or the family room of your life where we meet with people for fellowship? Who are your friends? The Bible says don't hang out with an angry person. It says a Christian should not even eat a meal with another Christian who's guilty of greed. I know, you probably think, well, then I'm not going to have any friends. And sadly, that's getting closer to the truth all the time. That's why we need to grow up. What do you talk about around the fellowship table? What do you talk about when you sit in the living room of your life with friends? Is your conversation one that God can record in His book of remembrance that puts a smile on His face? Or does it grieve the Holy Spirit? <laughs> well, that's a good thing to talk about. Talk about the Word. Talk about the great things God's done for you. I'll tell you something that's really fun. Get together with a bunch of people and, and be creative about ways that you can help people. Start a sneaky secret givers club. Go out every day and be a spy for God. And when you spot a need, if you don't have what it takes to meet it, go get your club together and say, I, this, this person at work doesn't even have a mattress to sleep on. How about if we pool our money and get them a mattress? I tell you what, you'll get so happy you won't be able to stand yourself. Stop praying for God to do things for people that you could do but just don't want to spend the money. Come on, I said stop praying for God to do things for people that you could easily do but just don't want to spend the money or the time or the effort. Oh God, I pray that you'd encourage Sister Brown, well, pick up the phone. Well, God, I pray that you would help that single mother at work that's about to go crazy because she never has any time by herself. Well, go watch your kids one night and tell her to go out. <laughs> or just keep your leaves and have no fruit. <laughs> and then when it comes to friends and the people that we fellowship with, don't have such an intense need for people. Don't get entangled. Love everybody, help people, but don't get entangled in their messes and their lives and want to know everything about them, getting in all their business. You don't need to get up in somebody else's business. You got enough of your own to tend to. And I do too. I do too. While we're doing this, how about we go by the kitchen for a minute? How about turning your eating over to God? Come on, don't make me come out there and get you. Well, God don't care about that kind of stuff. <laughs> How about letting God into the bathroom of your life so you even replace the toilet paper roll when it's gone? Come on, I told a little story one of the other meetings about going to the bathroom at the nail shop and I used the last of the toilet paper and you know, I felt like God wanted me to take the time to find some more in there in a drawer somewhere and so I'm going through the drawers and then place it on the roll and at first I took it and just sat it on top of the thing and I thought, 
I don't need to put it on the roll. Next person can do that. I've already gotten the toilet paper out. And then he said, put it on the roll. And I know you may think I'm a lunatic. I don't care what you think. You got to let God into every area of your life. If he tells you to replace the toilet paper roll, you replace it. If he tells you to put your grocery cart back, you put it back. If we're not going to obey God in little things, we're not going to obey him in big things. You go buy a pair of shoes and you find out they accidentally gave you two pair instead of one, don't go home and say, oh, praise God, he blessed me. <laughs> don't you steal them shoes. Well, I'm not going to waste my time and my gas taking those things back. They shouldn't have given them to me anyway. You get yourself in your car, you spend your money, you do whatever you have to do to be a person of integrity. How about letting God into the workroom of your life? Are you doing anything with your life that's bearing fruit? Or are you just taking up space? What kind of legacy are you going to leave? Last year in December, my only sibling, my brother, died in an abandoned building. The sad thing was, was when they sent me his personal effects, they all fit into an eight and a half by 11 manila envelope and we still had a lot of space left. Personal effects, the effect of his life. What a sad waste. He had opportunity, but he wouldn't be responsible. He had lots of problems, drugs, alcohol, wrong relationships, debt, all kinds of things. He lived with us for four years. We helped him. He got back on his feet. He got healthy. He had nice clothes. He was driving a nice vehicle. He worked for the ministry. But as soon as he went out on his own again. You know what? There's nobody that can help you if you won't help yourself. You got to learn how to do what's right when nobody's looking because God is always looking. God was in that bathroom with me. He was in that grocery store with me. He knew when I bought the shoes and they stuck a purse in there that I didn't pay for. And he prompted me to go take it back. And the clerk was amazed. Well, people should be amazed at us. That's a good time to wear a cross around your neck. Come on, is anybody, am I getting through to anybody today? We are the home of God. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit by sitting at work all week and gossiping about your coworkers and then going to church on Sunday morning with your bumper sticker on your car. How about your recreation room? Have you let him into the movies you watch? Your entertainment, your choice of friends. There's nothing wrong with having a good time. There's nothing wrong with dancing, I don't think. I'm sure somebody will write me a letter, but you know, I mean, there, but there could be something wrong with it if you do it in a lustful, ugly way. There's nothing wrong with a good movie, but some of them you're going to have to turn off. There's nothing wrong with playing games, but I don't think somebody needs to gamble on them and lose their whole income through some kind of a bad habit. A lot of times in the past, because Christians couldn't control themselves, they made a rule against everything. And then what ends up happening is that nobody wants to be a Christian because they think they can't do anything. And it's not that you can't do anything. You just got to choose what you can do and what you can't do. And we need to glorify God in our entertainment, in our eating habits, in our spending habits, with who we hang out with. We need to let Him in every room of our life. How about letting Him into the bedroom?
Oh, Joyce. <laughs> How about letting them into your sex life? You know, sex is not bad. It was ordained and created by God, but it's not to be abused. It's not allowed outside of marriage. Now, please don't, don't, don't turn the television off. It's just very popular today for people to live together and try it out for a few years before they even think about getting married. But can I tell you something? And I, I'm not, I love you, but it's not popular with God. And it's not good for you. If the Holy Spirit's grieved, we're grieved. Amen? And there's an, a lot of people who say they're Christians and have all kinds of behaviors like that. Listen, we're in the world, but not of it. We're not better than the world. We don't have to, you know, act like we're holier than everybody else. But we need to be in the world and be who we are so we can be a light in a dark place. And we don't need to be religious. We need to bear good fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness. You take that sinner that you work with and start being good to them, meet some needs for them, pray for them, you might be amazed what would happen. The marriage bed is to be kept holy and undefiled. Pornography would not make Jesus comfortable. And then as we move toward closing, how about the hall, the closet, the attic, or the basement of your house? Maybe we ought to throw in the garage. <laughs> because you see, this is usually the place where we hide all the things left over from the old life. The things we hang on to that we don't really think that we'll ever use anymore, but we want to hang on to them just in case. You know, even after God dealt serious with, serious with me about self-pity, because I spent a lot of time feeling, feeling sorry for myself. He said, you can't be pitiful and powerful. I can't be powerful in the pulpit and go home and sit in the bathroom floor and cry because Dave's watching a football game. <laughs> but even after I officially gave up self-pity, I put it somewhere in the back of the closet of my life just in case I wanted to have one more pity party. <laughs> How about getting rid of everything that's not pleasing to God? What are you hanging on to that needs to go? Let's do a thorough house cleaning. Now let me just say this before anybody gets into a huge works trip. You can't do any of this without God. So the first thing you need to do is go home and say, God, here I am, a living sacrifice. Unto you I give my life, I offer myself up to you. Take all my faculties, everything that I am, every room in my life, I throw the door wide open for you, God. And I tell you, many of you have no idea what you're even saying or what that's gonna equate into. It's gonna be a lot of pain, I can tell you that. No, I'm not in for that. <laughs> okay, well then go ahead and be miserable. There is that option. You know, I had no idea what I was saying to God when I began to pray prayers like this. And man, I tell you what, God has started putting his finger on things in my life that I was like, oh no, God, not that, not that, not that, not that. Oh God, anything but that, anything but that. Oh God, please don't make me do that. 
So it's time to clean house, ladies and gentlemen. You have a divine guest that's living inside of you all the time. You're the home of God. First Corinthians 6, 19 says that we are the temple of God. That means that we are the home or the house of God. He lives within us and we need to make a decision to be mindful of Him all the time.